Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. For a while, whenever I typed my name into the YouTube search engine, one of the recurring top suggestions was a military analysis of 300. After noticing this, I came to the conclusion you all wanted me to analyse this film. So I shall do so. Before we begin properly, I want to make a few things clear so we do not get off to a rough start. Firstly, I shall not be commenting on how historically accurate the film is. Plenty of other YouTubers have done that job already, and in detail which I couldn't hope to match. I shall try to keep the number of historical references small during this analysis. Secondly, I shall not be factoring in the motivations of the characters. What do I mean by this? I mean that I shall not give a pass to bad actions or decisions, just because it makes sense according to a character's personality. It is one thing for a character to make a poor decision, based on limited information, but it is quite another for him to order his forces to jump over the phalanx because he is full of pride and wants to show those smelly dwarves who the master race is. A bad tactical decision is a bad tactical decision regardless of the motivations. Thirdly, as a general rule, I shall not be analysing the individual heroics of the main heroes in the story because it is part of generic convention that some characters be able to pull off great and glorious feats in battle. Fourthly, I need to address this objection right out of the gate. But your Imperial Majesty, why even bother with a military analysis of 300? In the context of the film, the actions of the characters are supposed to be fictitious. Dilos is just telling a story to inspire the rest of the Spartans. This is almost a good objection, but there is a problem. Dilos is trying to persuade a nation of warriors of what took place at the Hot Gates. These are people who would not be fooled into believing something unless it made military sense to them. So it is likely that Dilos' description of the events and actions is more or less accurate. As well, it doesn't even matter if it is almost or mostly fictitious, or exaggerated in the dying Jesus of the film, because this analysis will still have worth as a constructive critique on how Dillus could have fabricated a more convincing story. Lastly, as a preface, I like 300 as a film. This is the first film I'm analysing which I actually enjoyed, and still do enjoy watching. However, I shall be analysing this film in my usual style, and will not be taking prisoners. With that, let's begin. We shall start the analysis here. I do not have anything to say about the Agog. Agog? Agogi? It's all Greek to me. Other than it is more or less historically accurate, and the system did produce very fierce warriors. So King This Is Sparta Leonidas is explaining his battle plan to the Ephors. We will block the Persian coastal assault by rebuilding the Great Phocian Wall, and from there we will funnel them into the mountain pass we call the Hot Gates. Now in that narrow corridor, their numbers will count for nothing. A wave after wave of Persian attack will smash against Spartan shields. Xerxes' losses will be so great, his men so demoralized, he will have no choice but to abandon his campaign. Considering that the Persian force is much larger than the Spartan one, and would be outnumbered on the field of battle, this plan is sensible, although I am unsure how Leonidas knows so much about the Persians' movements, and where they are going to land their ships. The only things we are told, by the Persian emissary, are the army is big, and it is currently on the move. So I'm unsure where Leonidas is getting his intelligence. Maybe he has agents, or the other Greek cities have been keeping a vigilant eye on the Persians. Maybe they didn't push all the Persians in, well. It isn't clear, and is never explained in the film. Anyhow, the proposed strategy is good, because it would go some way to negate the Persians' numeral superiority, thus increasing the Greeks' chance of victory. One of the major benefits to having a large army on an open field of battle is you can extend your battle line to such an extent that you can outflank your opponents, surround them, and attack them from all sides. As well, having more men, it is easier to wear down an opposing force and tire them out. The pass of the hot gates is so narrow that outflanking is not an option, thus the Persians' superior numbers are somewhat mitigated. Now, the reason King This Is Sparta is explaining his plan to these priests rather than his subordinates is because there is a religious festival taking place, the Carnie, and the Spartans are a very religious people and will not go to war without the approval of the gods. The Ephors on the mountain have an oracle who can supposedly hear messages from the gods, and Leonidas wants them to tell him the gods won't be angered if Sparta drops the festival and goes to war. Unbeknownst to King This Is Sparta, the decrepit Ephors have been bribed with Persian gold and tell him that the gods do not approve his plan, and that Sparta cannot go to war with Persia without risking the wrath of the gods. The Carnie must be observed. 
King of this Sparta is not very religious, and knows that allowing the Persians to enter the open fields and plains of Greece will leave his forces at a disadvantage, so he decides to officially obey the command of the ephors while actually disobeying it. He picks 300 Spartan warriors, and declares to the other officials of Sparta that he is going for a stroll, and that the accompanying 300 are his personal bodyguard. Since Sparta is not officially at war, and the Carnier has not been cancelled, he hasn't disobeyed the gods, or that is his argument to the rest of the officials, who are at a loss as to what to do. Now, let us examine these 300. Let's start with the good. They all have shields and greaves, and they all seem physically fit and able. Although there is the question of how much of their musculature is aesthetic, and how much is functional. Needless to say, they probably have more functional muscle than the average man, and aesthetic muscle can be intimidating, so possessing some is not a bad thing. Now on to the negatives. They have shields and greaves made of bronze, and later we see they have bronze helmets as well. Why do they not have breastplates, or suits of linen armour, or linothorax? None of these men seem to come from poor families, so surely they would be able to afford such armour. One of these men is in fact Captain... Hmm. Captain E. McCaptain's face's son. Surely he at least could afford some armour. And what about King This Is Sparta? Did he give all his money to the E4s at the beginning of the film? Why doesn't he have any armour? He's the most important man in the company. The Spartans clearly know how to make armour. They have greaves, so I do not think it would be difficult for their blacksmiths to make breastplates. But even if we assume for the sake of argument that the soldiers are either too poor to buy, or their blacksmiths too incompetent to make breastplates, that still doesn't explain their half-naked states. Wearing thick wool would provide physical protection. Even wearing a normal thick jumper would provide some protection. Even a modicum of protection in battle is better than none. Furthermore, having clothes can be useful in the case of cold nights, or for use as strips for binding wounds. Apparently, though, the 300 gym rats want to show their enemies just how effective their workout routines are. King Leonidas and his men join up with another Greek force seeming to consist of men from various Greek city-states, but the most notable contingent is Arcadian. Somehow, this Greek force is even less armoured than the Spartans. The leader of this army, an Acadian, Daxos the Nervous, expresses surprise and anxiety over the small size of the Spartan force, but King Leonidas simultaneously reassures and humiliates him with wit. Later, the joint forces find a destroyed town en route. Captain E. McCaptain looks at the tracks and says he camps a force of 20 men. Leonidas concludes that this was a scouting force, and a brutally effective one. At first, they cannot find the bodies of the citizens, but then they find them, all of them nailed to a tree. This is a clear example of a terror tactic. In terms of military strategy, it can be effective. The aim with such tactics is to instill terror and fear into the hearts of your enemies, so that they do not want to fight you. If your enemies don't want to fight you, they are more likely to surrender, or acquiesce to your demands. However, such tactics can have the opposite effect. Vile acts such as these can enrage the enemy, and strengthen their resolve, and make them fight all the harder. Indeed, we see two reactions to this act. Daxos starts panicking and claiming there is no chance of victory, and they will all die at the hands of the Persian immortals. King Leonidas, however, with a restrained anger, says that they will put the Immortals' name to the test. This terror tactic may be working on Daxos, but it is clearly having the opposite effect on Leonidas. When the Greeks arrive at the Hot Gates and Panopoli, they find the Persians have also just arrived, and are commencing landings. If the entire Spartan army were available, opposing the landings might well have been a valid strategy. But with 300 soldiers and some unconfident Greek allies, it wouldn't work now. A large portion of the fleet is sunk in a storm, but the very next day, Daxos the Nervous and Stelos the Madman see the massive encamped force, and Daxos has another panic attack. And Stelos has a crazy attack, characteristic of his personality. Now, the pass is very tight, and is the only way through the mountains to the wider, more open landscapes of Greece. However, there is one open way around it, right here. So the Greeks build a stone wall to block it off, presumably an armed force could go around this bend and find themselves on the opposite side of the pass. So if this wall was scaled, then the Persians could outflank and attack the Spartans from behind. What is most definitely a failure on the Persians' part is their non-existent attempts to scale the wall. Throughout the film, it will be seen there are plenty of times where the Spartans are too preoccupied killing Persians to be able to oppose a group of men trying to scale the wall. But the Persians don't try it ever. The wall isn't even manned, so makeshift ladders are surely not out of the Persians' crafting capabilities. Why the Persians never once try to scale this wall is beyond me. 
King Mrs. Sparta Leonidas and Captain Nemo Captain Face have a discussion about the possibility of being outflanked in general. The captain states that he hasn't found a route which the Persians could use to accomplish such a maneuver. Then the hunchback of Notre Dame appears from the shadows and tells them that there is a path used by mountain goats which the Persians could use. Captain Nemo Captain reacts with horror upon seeing the hunchback outside his usual cathedral back in Paris, but King Leonidas maintains his composure. Quasimodo introduces himself as I'm not even going to try. Anyway, with much passion and enthusiasm, he beseeches Leonidas for the honour of fighting with his men. He demonstrates his skill with the spear, and Leonidas is impressed. However, when Leonidas asks him to raise his shield, Quasimodo is physically unable. Leonidas, with surprising gentleness, explains to Quasi that the Spartan's strength comes from the phalanx formation. Every soldier depends on the man to his right and left and one gap or weak spot would be exploited by the enemy. Quasi's lack of ability with the shield would make him a liability in the phalanx. For this reason, Leonidas explains, he cannot fight with the Spartans. The king tells him, I'm sorry, my friend, but not all of us were made to be soldiers. We're done! If you want to help in a Spartan victory, yes. clear the battlefield of the dead, tend the wounded, bring them water. But as for the fight itself, I cannot use you. Now, King Leonidas' reason and explanation are both rather good. I cannot argue with his assessment that Quasi should not be part of the Spartan Phalanx. However, we shall talk about the Phalanx a bit later, and come back to this point. But I am unsure as to why he didn't place Quasi in the reserve with the rest of the Greek forces. The Persians' numbers are enormous, and at this juncture, fussiness is probably not wise. Unlike the rest of the non-Spartan Greek force, Quasi is actually eager to fight, and doesn't seem scared of the coming battle with the Persians. It is possible, by placing him with the rest of the Greeks, that he might inspire them. Or shame them. I cannot imagine that any of the other Greeks, blessed with healthy bodies, would want to be outdone by a hunchback. It wouldn't sound or look very good. Leonidas tells his captain, Dispatch the Phocians to the goat path. Pray to the gods, nobody tells the Persians about it. I have to wonder why he didn't send any Spartans to help defend the pass. This pass is potentially a battle winner for the Persians, and the only way, if we exclude scaling the wall, to outflank the Greek force. Defending it should be a priority, yet he is sending the Phoenicians to defend it, and presumably they are of Daxos's temperament. Considering that the path is one for goats, it probably isn't very wide, and could be held by only a handful of soldiers. Can Leonidas not spare even a few of his soldiers to oversee and lead the presumably unprofessional and scared Phoenicians? Now we come to the first engagement. The Spartans have formed their phalanx in the middle of the hot gates, and await the charge of the Persians. Now, let's talk about spears. Greek spears in particular. The spears used in phalanx at this time tended to be either six or nine feet long. In this shot, the Spartan spears seem to be about 9 feet long. The point of a spear, whether in a phalanx or in the hands of a lone fighter, is to keep the enemy at a distance. Ideally, your spear will be longer than the weapon of your opponent, allowing you to strike in relative safety. Anyone who played with sticks as a young boy will tell you that having the longer stick was always an advantage. However, trying to fight with a spear at close range is not optimal. The bigger a weapon is, the more unwieldy it will be at closer ranges and harder to use effectively. With that said, we can see that the Spartans are not even trying to exploit the reach of their spears. They are holding them really close to their shields and do not seem to want to stop their foes from getting close. Why? You are supposed to use a spear's reach when in combat. That's the point. Using them as a type of short sword defeats the point. If the Spartans actually want the Persians to close in, why bother with the spears? The Spartans have swords in this film. Why not put the spears aside and just use the swords if they don't want to use them properly? Or why not throw the spears instead? Now obviously you don't want to overextend your spear so that you do not have a firm grip on it, but come on, I think the Spartan spears can go a bit further than that. With no long spears to stop them, the Persians charge into the Spartan shield wall and... <laughs> Alright, I love the way this is filmed. The shots are close and tight, effectively conveying the atmosphere of the situation and the pushing and shoving taking place. However, let's look at what is actually happening. The Persians are pushing against the shield wall, and the Spartans are trying to push back. This is it in a nutshell. What are the Persians trying to achieve precisely? They don't seem to be trying to kill the Spartans, or if they are, they're not doing a very good job of it. They seem content just to push against the Spartan shields, 
in an attempt to drive them back. But when were they actually going to attempt killing the Spartans? It doesn't make a great deal of sense. They aren't likely to push through the phalanx, as it is quite compact and can easily be reformed because of the narrowness of the pass. It seems an awful lot of effort for very little reward. Stabbing someone who isn't wearing any proper armour is not so difficult. Also, did the Persians want to kill themselves? Considering the stout wart nature of the Spartan line and the mass of Persians, I wouldn't want to be the soldiers in front on either side. The people in front would be crushed to death by the men behind them, slammed and crumpled on their opponent's shields. Why would any man with a self-preservation instinct want to be crushed like this? I have no idea. Although I suppose it is possible that these men are either raw recruits or slaves, and do not know what they are doing. It would explain a lot. Now it has to be said that from a cold-hearted commander's perspective, a couple of dozen soldiers being crushed to death by their comrades to break through a line and kill the enemy might be worth it. But there is one problem with this tactic, and that has to do with troop morale. If soldiers in your army get the idea that going into battle is likely to result in them being crushed to death, not by the enemy, but by their fellow comrades, unit cohesion is unlikely to exist. As well, friendship bonding and trust will not exist either. No soldier will want to fight in the front ranks, if they suspect they will be crushed to death by the ranks behind them. If you cannot trust the men in your own unit, then your morale and desire to fight is not likely going to be high, and no amount of potential battle honour is likely to persuade one to stand in front. Officers would likely have to force men to form in front, and then stay away from the front themselves. A bit like commissars in the Soviet army during the Second World War. All in all, the Persians could do a lot of things better here. But what of the Spartans? The Spartans are doing the same thing for the most part. They are pushing back, but seem reluctant to try and kill the Persians. Why? They are the enemy, and they are attacking your line. Stab them already. Eventually, however, the Spartans unleash. You will see this a lot in the film. Spartans thrusting their spears into the enemy, and either dropping or raising their shields above their heads at the same time. I hope I don't actually have to explain why this is foolish, but I will. While dropping the shield in this manner would indeed make thrusting easier, and no doubt increase reach and force, it does leave you open for an enemy counterattack. Even if you successfully kill your chosen target and he doesn't respond, the man next to him might see the opening and seize the opportunity and stab you. In battle, it would not be a good idea to lower your shield and expose your unarmoured torso to the enemy. Who trained the Spartans to fight like this? You should be fired, court-martialed, and spat on. The Persians start to back down out of fear, and the Spartans advance. Now I know that Leonidas is basically Aris, along with the other Spartans, so this kind of prowess is to be expected. However, from a tactical point of view this isn't wise. There is a reason that shield walls are ubiquitous in history. That reason is this. When you are part of a shield wall, your flanks are defended by men on either side of you. This gives you some security from the threat of encirclement and being forced to deal with too many enemies at once. Breaking formation even to chase down a retreating foe, leaves you at risk of being counterattacked. And of course, if you are counterattacked in such a state, you will likely not be able to form an effective shield wall with your companions, making you easier prey. An example of how bad this can be, can be found in the Battle of Hastings, where at one point during the battle, the Norman forces battling the Anglo-Saxons turned around and started running away. A sizable number of Anglo-Saxons began chasing them, and broke from the then unbroken shield wall. The Normans then turned around and attacked the Anglo-Saxons and had a better time of it because the shield wall was broken. The rest is history, as they say. Now I can hear an objection. But your Imperial Majesty, the Spartans want to attack quickly and breaking formation is the best way to do so. Leaving aside the question, as to whether risking death by fighting as an individual rather than as part of a unit is worth it, to cover some more ground, I honestly don't think it's true. There doesn't seem to be a strength or fitness disparity between the individual Spartans, so they could all probably advance together as one, more or less at the same pace without difficulty. The main reason that breaking from a group is sometimes faster than being part of it is because of the fitness and leg length disparities between the different members. Since physically there are very few differences between the Spartans, they all seem fit and appear to have the same leg length, I do not see why anyone would need to break from formation to cover more ground. Together as a formation, everyone could advance at much the same pace as we see in this scene. 
Also, this decision by the Spartans, and they do this kind of thing a lot in the film, raises an obvious question. Why did King Leonidas tell Cosimodo he had no use for him in the battle? If the Spartans are going to break formation to go on epic killing sprees, why shouldn't Quasi be allowed? Remember, the given reason was because he would be a weakness in the phalanx, but he doesn't need to be part of the phalanx. Just put Quasi in the reserve and tell him that when the 300 break formation to charge, he can join in. Indeed, why not tell Daxos the Nervous and his men to line up in reserve and join in when the 300 break formation to charge? The more men the better. Moving on, it isn't shown precisely how, but because of the formationless Spartan advance, a large number of Persians are trapped with their backs to the edge of the cliff. The Spartans take advantage and push the Persians into the sea below. Nothing to see here. The Persian officers clearly notice the slaughter of their infantry, because they respond by first ordering their archers to fire a volley of arrows, which does nothing, and then by sending what looks like multiple units of cavalry to charge the Spartans. The Spartans reassemble into this formation. Other than the fact the Spartans are still not exploiting the full length of their spears to meet the cavalry charge, there isn't much to criticise with the formation itself. However, a far, far better strategy would be to reassemble in the actual choke point of the pass, and then use the full length of the spears to create a hedgehog of death for the horsemen. I believe this would be very effective at dissuading the cavalry from charging, because the only available tactic would be to charge directly into the spears. While a horse might do such a thing, Human beings tend to be intelligent enough to know when something will likely kill them, and have an equally strong, if not greater, self-preservation instinct. I cannot imagine any Persian wanting to charge into certain death head first. The current formation allows the horsemen to ride round the Spartans and attempt passing strikes with their sabres, and this incidentally is what they do. Reforming in the hot gates would likely dissuade the Persians from charging at all. However, even if the Persians were suicidal and did charge in, the Spartans would be in a good position for two reasons. First, because the gap is so narrow, it would create a choke point, and it wouldn't take long for it to clog up from the number of dead horses and horsemen. Second, the ground there is covered with corpses. Horses running at full pelt would likely trip over the cadvias. In all likelihood, the riders would have to slow the speed of their horses down, thus making their charge less effective and making it easier for the Spartans to stab them. For these stated reasons, I think it would have been a far better move to reform the phalanx in the actual gap of the hot gates. At any rate, it doesn't matter too much, because the Spartans seem to kill the Persian chargers with enough efficiency, and don't appear to lose any men themselves. The camera cuts almost as soon as the engagement begins. The next we see of the 300, they are piling corpses to make a wall. Now, we shall discuss the purpose of this move a little later, but for now we shall consider the decision to pile these bodies as shown. There is good reason to bury your own dead and the enemy's dead on the battlefield, and not only because it is civil to do so, but also to remove the possibility of disease. Dead things attract flies among other pests, and corpses in close proximity create a cesspool where bacteria can mix and thrive. This is why dead things tend to smell so vile. Now, when dealing with corpses, it is best to spend as little time as possible around them and to make sure you are well covered up. Displaying open wounds to bacteria is not wise, and you can risk infection by doing so. I think everyone can guess where I'm going with this. The 300 are not dressed for this kind of work. Their bare arms, hands and chests are exposed, and will make a lot of contact with the bodies. We must also remember that the 300 have already fought a battle with exposed torsos. If they have received any wounds because of their decision to fight without armour, they will have high chances of being infected. Now to be fair, these corpses are only a day old, but that is enough time for bacteria and pests to start doing their thing. King This is Sparta, by ordering these bodies to be piled into a wall, risks plague among his men, and he cannot really risk such a thing, because he has very few to spare. Truly, I think this is a dreadful decision. But since the Spartans are willing to risk endemics and infection, what is the intention of the wall? We find out later that day. I'm not sure whether this scene takes place at night, dawn, or twilight. King Xerxes, the I'm too hipster to wear a crown like mainstream kings, has decided to take off the kids' gloves, and has sent his best troops, the Immortals, which according to history, always numbered precisely 10,000. To this division belong the 20 men who were responsible for the destruction of the town seen earlier in the film. The Immortals are actually wearing armour, unlike the Spartans, the other Greeks, and Persian warriors. However, the armour doesn't seem to protect them from anything in this film, so I'm not sure why they are wearing it. Some protection is always better than none, but are the Persians incapable of making good armour? They are also equipped with a sword in each hand and do not have any shields. This is bizarre. For the most part, warriors in history either carry two-handed weapons or a weapon paired with a shield. 
Two-handed weapons have greater reach and can do more damage, while a one-handed weapon with a shield affords good protection with an ability to fight back. Carrying a weapon in each hand did happen in fencing duels, or in fights where it was one-on-one, -on -one, but in pitched battles this was rare, primarily because while two weapons are better than one, you are not afforded a great advantage by having two. It is much better to have either a bigger weapon, requiring two hands, or a shield for greater protection. I do have to ask why the Immortals are not armed with great swords or with shields. If they had great swords, they would have reach, and if they had shields, they would be able to form shield walls and protect themselves from attacks. I really do not understand why they have chosen to carry a weapon in each hand instead. Anyhow, the Immortals approach the pass in an ordered and confident manner, and are met with a wall comprised of the Persian dead, a rather impressive yet grim structure, which completely blocks the path. This is when we see King This Is Sparta's plans unfold. Spartans, push! This is a complete waste. The Spartans risked infection by creating this wall all for the cost of one crushed immortal. This is the definition of a high risk yet low reward venture. The 300 should have waited until more Persians gathered beneath the wall, or even started climbing it before doing this. That way, more Persians would have been crushed under the weight of the dead. But your Imperial Majesty, what if the Immortals decided to stand there and didn't try climbing the wall? That wouldn't actually be a problem. The 300 are playing for time at this point. They just need to hold out until the Carnier Festival takes place, and then the rest of the Spartan army will likely march to help them. I say likely, because the Persians have an agent in the Spartan government called Pheron. However, the 300 don't know this, so playing for time would seem to be a reasonable strategy. Besides, the 300 can move away from the wall and relax themselves if the Persians decided to stop for a spot of tea. Anyway, the Spartans charge in and kill their first immortal, who somehow didn't die after being crushed by the falling corpses. King Leonidas kills an ogre, and in the chaotic battle, which could have been less chaotic if the incompetent Spartans had actually tried forming a phalanx when they advanced, the Spartans gradually come out on top, although for the first time, some of them actually die on screen. In the middle of the fighting, King Leonidas shouts out to Daxos to attack. Earlier in the day, Leonidas was told that the rest of the Greeks were eager for some glory in combat, and he told Captain Ema Captain to tell Daxos to select his 20 best men. Leonidas said he would give them something they could handle. I think the good Spartan king might be some kind of pre-internet troll, because he asks Daxos and his men to attack the best of the Persians. Although, to be fair, you cannot always predict what will happen in a war, so maybe he expected the Persians to send more grunts, like the day before. Anyway, I'm actually surprised Daxos managed to hear him over the commotion of combat. I would have suggested a horn signal, as horns can be more easily heard over the action of combat. Anyway, Daxos does hear, and he charges with his men into the immortal's flank. It turns out there is a cave which Daxos and the other 20 Greeks were hiding in. I'm not sure how big the cave is, but if it can only hide about 20 individuals, then Leonidas' orders make sense. But if it can contain more, then telling Daxos to only bring 20 men is the epitome of stupidity. If you can attack a position with more men, it is nearly always best to do so. And in this case, attacking with more men would be even more effective. However, I shall give everyone the benefit of the doubt, and assume the cave was only wide enough for around 20 souls. Anyhow, Daxos the Nervous and his men actually managed to kill some of the immortals, although they do not do so in such an epic manner as the Spartans. The Spartans then join the other Greeks in slaughtering the Immortals. At this point, the Spartans finally form a shield wall, something they should have done at the beginning of the conflict. The camera moves up as the fighting continues, and we see Xerxes on the cliffs above. Firstly, why is he even there, alone, out in the open? If he was noticed by a Spartan, and that Spartan recognised him, I'm sure a spear would be flying in his direction. I will make a greater deal of this a little later, but for the moment it is fair to say that losing your leading commander is not a good thing in a war. Secondly, why haven't the Persians stationed archers up here for this battle? The Spartans for a noticeable period of time before attacking the rest of the immortals with Daxos. Surely that would have been a good moment to let loose at them? Wouldn't it have been a good idea to station some archers up there just in case such an opportunity presented itself? Indeed, even at this point in the battle, some carefully aimed arrows would aid the Immortals fighting below. If the arrows were carefully aimed, then the chances of the Immortals being hit would be low, and it would probably be worth the risk to open some gaps in the Spartan line and to pressure them to retreat and give ground. 
But despite the fact that the Persians clearly have access to the tops of these cliffs, we only see them station archers there towards the end of the film. We do not see the eventual defeat of the Immortals in this battle, but as we see more Immortals later on in the film, I assume they retreated. The next day, the Persians try throwing different units at the 300, and try some new tactics. Let's discuss this rhinoceros. Now, I'm going to assume that it is tame, to some degree, as the Persians have managed to put armour on it. I do wonder, though, what precisely is making the creature charge at the Spartans. If you release a tame horse, even a tame warhorse, it will not just charge at the nearest line of men, it has to be directed by a rider. But what is directing this rhinoceros? I cannot see a rider on top of it, and if it was stabbed in the behind, it would likely just run a couple of yards away where it felt safe. Or it would turn around and gore the fool who dared stab it. This looks like a white rhinoceros, and adult white rhinoceroses can weigh from 3 to 5 tons. It is not a beast to be messed with. At any rate, the idea of charging a rhinoceros at a shield wall can't be argued. Rhinoceroses happily attack safari cars and lorries. They would make mincemeat of a shield wall comprised of human men. The only question is how the Persians managed to direct this rhinoceros towards the 300, and how they even managed to tame one in the first place. The Spartans somehow managed to keep their cool, and wait as one of their men, Captain Junior, throws a spear at it. He hits it in the head, and the spear manages to pierce through the rhinoceros's thick skin and skull, and the creature dies before completing the charge. I wouldn't want to test this, but if you stabbed a rhinoceros in the head at a certain point in its charge towards a battle line, it might well die and skid across the ground without completing the charge. However, what is completely beyond me is how only one of the Spartans threw a spear at it. What if he missed? What if his spear hit, but only did superficial damage? The creature would likely be so close that by the time another Spartan threw a spear at it, the beast would finish its charge and tear a hole through the shield wall. Why didn't a whole rank of men throw their spears at it? To be safe, rather than sorry. If Captain Junior's spear hadn't killed it, the rest of the men would be in grave peril. A whole rank of men should have thrown their spears rather than rely on one man's attempt. The next tactic the Persians try is gunpowder, and I have to say the Spartans do not respond very well to it. The grenades being thrown are not that powerful, they are not breaking through the shields of the Spartans. Keeping this in mind, one would expect the Spartan commanders to notice this, and order their troops to form a tortoise formation with their shields, and then advance to the Persian line to kill the assailants. Although this would make sense, the Spartans instead opt for a scattered formation of loose individuals. This is bad for two reasons. Firstly, no protection from debris, as seen in this shot. But secondly, it leaves every individual Spartan open to the threat of death. All the grenades are shown hitting the centre of the shield, doing no damage to the Spartan behind it. However, if a grenade were to land next to a Spartan, a foot or two away, or just behind him, that man would be toast. This is why it is astounding that the 300 have not been ordered to arrange themselves into a tortoise formation. Now obviously the Persians might respond by hurling their grenades at one point in the formation to try and blast a gap in the ranks, but that would still mean the rest of the formation could move towards the Persian line and get close enough that the Persians would not be able to throw their grenades without killing their own. As it stands, the Spartans are cowering behind their shields, scattered. Fortunately, the Spartans have a hero in Stelios, the madman, who decides to attack the Persians on his own. He charges at the Persians, breaks through their line, and knocks down one of the Persian grenadiers. Now I'll be honest, I'm not sure whether this is a woman or a man. All the Persians in this film appear to wear mascara, but these grenadiers are wearing garments which are not too dissimilar to what women actually wear in the Middle East. Right, so the grenadiers piled all their grenades into one massive pile, judging by the explosion in the distance in this shot, which was only a yard or two away from the main front line. This is incompetence of the highest measure. What idiot allows his grenadiers to place all their ammunition in one location where a single explosion or misfire could cause everything to go up in flames? The commander in charge needs to be disciplined. Okay, perhaps that was a bit harsh. The Persians then send three war elephants at the Spartans. I don't have a lot to say about this part of the film, other than I'm unsure as to why the elephants are not charging at the Spartans. There are accounts of war elephants crushing men and soldiers underfoot, 
I'm surprised they are not doing so here. I know someone is going to mention Scapio Africanus' tactics at Zama for dealing with war elephants, splitting into two corridors and stabbing the elephants in the sides. There is one problem I see with adopting such a strategy here, and that is that the cliff top doesn't seem wide enough to adopt such tactics effectively. Simply put, there doesn't appear to be enough space. On the subject of space, I have to say these elephants are very large. I think they would have difficulty moving through the actual gap of the hot gates, which makes me wonder why the Spartans aren't in the gap itself trying to kill the elephants. The elephants wouldn't have much room to manoeuvre, and might take some convincing to be led into a narrow gap filled with spears. Maybe the Spartans were there originally, but discovering that the elephants were weary of them, decided to move forwards and prod them over the edge of the cliff. The scene is very short and there is not enough information for me to try and make a detailed assessment of what is happening here. After the elephants we see Stelios, the madman, and Captain Junior doing heroic stuff in the middle of the battlefield. The Spartan King orders his men to reform the phalanx, but Stelios and Captain Junior stand there so they can listen to Captain Senior praise his son. Then out of the dust, a lone horseman charges past Captain Junior and slices his head off. We don't see this horseman again and I have to wonder why he was charging by himself rather than with a body of cavalry. Captain E. McCaptain takes his son's death very well considering. During the latter part of the day, Quasimodo grows tired of being left out of the fighting and realises he cannot earn any glory or acceptance among the Greeks and so goes to the Persians and is admitted to the tent of the Persian king. He is offered women, gold, acceptance, and a uniform in exchange for submission and the goat path information. With not much else going for him in life, Quasimodo accepts. That night, the Spartans are tending their wounds, when Daxos rides in on his horse. Where did he get this horse? I must infer he took it from the Persians, because the Greeks aren't otherwise depicted with horses in this film. Daxos tells Leonidas that Quasimodo has betrayed them and led the immortals to the goat path, and the Phoenicians surrendered without a fight. Daxos tells Leonidas they will be surrounded by dawn tomorrow, and the hot gates will fall. Now, Daxos the Nervous is clearly looking to King This Is Sparta for a solution to the problem. Now, which of these does our good king decide to do? A. Send some of his 300 up to the goat path to try and stop the Persians. B. Tell Daxos to send all his men to try and stop the Persians. Or C. Yell, prepare for glory. He does C. This is madness. Why doesn't Leonidas try to do A if he has Spartans to spare? And if he can't spare his own soldiers, why doesn't he tell Daxos to lead the rest of his army to try and stop the Persians? If the Persians are following a simple goat path, then surely it would not be too hard to find a choke point and try mounting a defence. But your imperial majesty, I hear some of you cry, there have to be reasons why they cannot execute options A and B, otherwise they would have chosen one of them. Stepping outside of the military analysis, there are reasons why they cannot do either A or B but they are narrative reasons and not military ones. If we refocus our lens back to military analysis, not one reason is given as to why A and B will not work. These possibilities are not even brought up by anyone. It just seems that Daxos is too scared to think straight, and Leonidas was punched too many times in the head as a child to think clearly. Seriously, why is no one even considering the option to try and stop the Persians in their tracks on the goat path? At this juncture, I can hear a question. What if, your imperial majesty, Leonidas wants to die a beautiful death, and isn't interested in winning the battle? This explanation almost works, but there is one problem. That doesn't seem to be his motivation. When discussing his plan with the ephors, he says this. Sparta will burn! Her men will die in arms, and her women and children will be slaves or worse! And when his men express fears over a possible assassination attempt that might happen if he goes and meet King Xerxes, he says this. If they assassinate me, all of Sparta goes to war. Pray, they're that stupid. Pray, we're that lucky. Leonidas consistently shows a desire to defeat the Persians and not allow them passage through the hot gates. If his motivation changed, it wasn't telegraphed. Also, even if he just wants to die, this decision is still an example of incompetence, because losing the hot gates would put his kingdom at risk of enslavement. Is selling your kingdom to foreign dominance for a beautiful death really a good trade? King Visisparta yells to his men to prepare for glory, and Daxos loses any previously existing will to fight, and says he will retreat with his men. Leonidas, meanwhile, recites Spartan law to his 300, and says there'll be no retreat and no surrender. King Visisparta then takes Faramir the gym-goer aside, and tells him to go back to Sparta to tell the kingdom what has happened, and what will happen. 
Notice the time of day King Visisparta gives Faramir the gym gubber these orders. Dawn. Where are the Persians? Didn't Daxos say they would be surrounded by morning? Leonidas is playing fast and loose with the available time he has, it seems. And he's not the only one. Apparently the rest of the Greeks have only just decided to leave as well. I thought Daxos would have ordered an immediate night march as soon as he got back on his horse. Maybe he is stupid rather than nervous. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, I do know that night marches can be difficult to organise and to pull off with primitive light sources. But if you need to escape an encirclement, you can work through these difficulties. As the rest of the 300 watch Faramir the gym goer and the other Greeks leave, King Visisparta turns to his men and tells them to eat a hearty breakfast because they will be dining in hell later on. Why do the Greeks have so much time in these scenes? We were told the Persians would encircle them by morning, and yet the Greeks act as if they have all day to do what they like. If they had so much time, why didn't they send a force to try and stop the immortals? On the subject of breakfast and food, I didn't see any supply wagons in the Spartan army, or in Daxos's army. How are the Spartans and Greeks getting their food? Anyway, the Persians surround the 300 and finally climb the cliff where Xerxes was standing during the immortal battle. This is what the Spartan position looks like. Not very good. Yet the Persians are not attacking, because Xerxes still hopes they will surrender, and that Leonidas will submit to his will. King Xerxes, the I'm too hipster to wear a crown like mainstream kings, has brought his throne close to the action, so he can watch King Vizis Sparta submit in person. The King of Sparta drops his weapons and armour, and kneels before the King of Persia, who does this in response. Okay. But then King Visisparta shouts the madman's name, and he charges out of the formation and stabs a Persian before assuming this stance. I'm not sure why he is holding the spear like that, because spears are supposed to be pointed at the enemy. The rest of the Spartans break out of the static tortoise formation and charge towards the Persians, but the Persian archers on the cliffs let loose and the 300 gym rats start falling in droves, the abs providing no defence against the arrows. They should have brought breastplates. While all of this is happening, King This is Sparta grabs his spear and hurls it at I'm too hipster to wear a crown like mainstream kings. But it misses the Persian skull by inches and instead cuts his cheek. So this is how the scene plays out. Now let's consider the problems. Firstly, how did Leonidas know that when he and the 300 were surrounded, they wouldn't just be slaughtered by the Persians immediately? How did he know King Xerxes would come to the front allowing him this opportunity to kill him? This decision to wait for the Persians to surround them and hope Xerxes would show up is risky to say the least. Again, it would have been far better to try and stop the Persians from surrounding them in the first place by sending men to the goat path. Secondly, the execution of the objective. The objective of this operation is to kill the Persian king, the commander-in-chief of the Persian forces. This is a good goal. In modern warfare, losing the main leader is discouraging and can cause distress and chaos, but it was an even worse blow in ancient times, because while modern militaries do their best to ensure there is always a second in command to take up the mantle of leadership, ancient and even medieval militaries didn't always have a clear line of leadership. Now, the film doesn't show us the command structure of the Persian army. Perhaps there is a clear second in command, or maybe there isn't. If there isn't, then the death of Xerxes could cause a crisis similar to the Battle of Tours. The leader of the Moorish forces was killed in battle. The Moors were rather confused as to what to do next, because there wasn't a clear second in command, and the Franks were in a good defensive position. Because of this, the Moors decided to cut their losses and head back to Spain. For the Spartans and the rest of Greece, it would be brilliant if the Persians decided to turn home. If what Xerxes said here is true, You have many slaves, Xerxes. A few warriors. It won't be long before they fear my spears. More than your whips. It's not the lash they fear. It is my divine power. Then the Persian slaves might well revolt if they discovered he was killed. And if the bulk of the Persian army is comprised of slaves, then that could spell disaster for the Persian expedition. Even if these two possible outcomes wouldn't take place with Xerxes' death, the Persian ruler's death would likely cause some chaos in the Persian chain of command, until a suitable general could be chosen. Back home in Persia, a successor would have to be chosen, and if that did not happen peacefully, the invasion of Greece could run into difficulties. A new ruler might even order the abandonment of the campaign. In short, the objective is solid, but the attempt to achieve this objective is badly conducted. Why on earth is Leonidas the only one throwing a spear? Why didn't all the 300 throw their spears? At least one of the 300 spears would have hit one of Xerxes' vital spots. This is an all-or-nothing affair. 
If this king is not killed, then nothing strategically important is gained. Assuming the decision of the Spartans not to throw all their spears had something to do with allowing their king to claim full honour, I must stress that this is not the time for that kind of thing. A couple of hundred spears are better than one. And if Leonidas fails, which he does, then nothing has ultimately been gained. I'm sure no one is silly enough to make this objection, but I need to cover my back here. This is the possible objection. Maybe King Leonidas didn't actually want to kill Xerxes, but just make him bleed, to hurt his ego and take him down a few notches. The counterpoint to this objection is simple. Forcing Xerxes to eat humble pie may be satisfying, but it doesn't solve the issue at hand, that issue being the Persian invasion of Greece. Killing him, however, affords military advantages and even the possibility of the invading forces turning around and heading home. Looking at this scene again, but focusing on the rest of the Spartans rather than Leonidas, I don't understand why they are all breaking from their formation. If they weren't going to bother throwing their spears at Xerxes, why didn't they just stay in their formation and wait for the Persians to attack them? The Persians would be forced to do so. Their arrows, as seen previously, are useless against the Spartan shields. If the Spartans stayed in this round tortoise formation, they could kill more Persians and delay the invasion, so the rest of Greece could prepare. Anyhow, King Leonidas humbles Xerxes but doesn't kill him, and then all his men die. We then see Faramir giving a powerful speech about the sacrifice of the 300 to 10,000 Spartans and 30,000 other Greeks, who are not wearing breastplates and charge into battle wildly, and not in formation. Apparently the Spartans haven't learned from any of the mistakes they made at the Hot Gates. The film then ends. 300 certainly has some very interesting military issues but I actually think it is better than the Battle of the Five Armies and the Last Jedi. I shall elaborate for anyone who is scratching his or her head. After receiving a lot of feedback in my last military analysis video, I decided to explicate my reasons for making military analysis videos in my 10,000 subscriber special, as well as to address some criticisms. I shall throw the hyperlink to that video in the description, but I shall summarise my reasons here. I make military analysis videos because I believe that the best villains are the ones who know what they are doing to a high degree. I am of the opinion that villains who make simple military mistakes are not good villains. If your story does not contain good villains, then there will be no tension, and the suspension of disbelief will be ruined. I also believe that the more competent your villains are, the better your heroes will be, and thus the audience will like them more. 300, in my view, does a fairly good job of establishing the Persians as villains worthy of respect. The Persians in this film are portrayed as outmatched, rather than incompetent, although they do make obvious mistakes, and are also shown to be good at schemes. At the beginning of the film, it is revealed that the ephors were paid by the Persians to say that Sparta could not go to war during the Carnier. This shows the audience two things. First, that the Persians are not stupid. The Persian command clearly knew that the Spartans were great warriors, and they show great wisdom by attempting to keep the Spartans in Sparta twiddling their thumbs. Their success in bribing the Ephors shows that they are good at sabotage and know the weaknesses of their foes. They knew the Ephors were greedy and had great influence over Sparta and decided to exploit these things. Secondly, it shows they are wealthy and rich. The Persians are very wealthy in 300, and this isn't only shown in the beginning of the film. Xerxes makes several offers to Leonidas offering wealth, glory, and honour if he agrees to bow to him. Xerxes also makes a very generous offer for the information concerning the goat path. The film does everything it can to persuade the audience that the Persians are rich enough to bribe people to their side. Wealth is a powerful asset in both peacetime and war. As well throughout the film, Theron is shown manipulating the authorities in Sparta to ensure that the Spartans don't go to war, further demonstrating how far the Persian Empire has stretched its tentacles and just how far it will go to undermine its opponents from within. In terms of the actual battle scenes, again, the Persians do make mistakes, but their problems seem to be that they are outmatched and the Spartans are in a good position. The Persian soldiers just aren't as good as the Spartans. The Spartans have been trained from birth to fight. These Persian formations consist of unhappy slaves for the most part. The Persians, to their credit, recognise this and try different tactics in an attempt to break the Spartans, such as sending in the Immortals, a charging rhinoceros, war elephants, and attempting to bomb them. In terms of position, the Spartans really have it made. The Persians' main advantage over the 300 and the rest of Greece is the size of their army, but because of the hot gates and the narrow cliff, they can only send a certain number of warriors at a time, meaning the advantages of their superior size are drastically reduced. The narrow pass also makes it nearly impossible to outflank and surround the Spartans. 
the audience could be made to believe that the many victories enjoyed by the 300 are plausible in the world of the film, and that the Persians are still a force to be reckoned with. The film's explanation of the strategic importance of the hot gates and the beginning scenes of the Agog convinces the audience that the reason the Spartans are winning is because of their martial prowess and their superior position and that they would lose in different circumstances. This makes it easy for the audience to respect the hero's deeds and decision to occupy the hot gates. And of course, the Persians are reaffirmed as dangerous villains by exploiting two of Leonidas' mistakes. First, that he did not send better troops to defend the goat path, and the second, that he did not send any troops to try and stop the Persians when the Phoenicians surrendered. Because the Persians actively exploit these mistakes and take advantage of the goat path, they kill the 300, proving the protagonists are not immortal and can be defeated in battle if they are outmaneuvered. What I'm trying to say in many words is that the Persians are a threat in this film and are not laughably bad or incompetent. The same cannot be said for General Hux or Azog. They make mistakes in The Last Jedi and the Battle of the Five Armies, but that in itself isn't egregious. What is egregious is that the type of mistakes they make are so simple that children can point them out. Why on earth didn't Hux order the Dreadnought to open fire on the Resistance fleet, which was trying to get away, and then destroy the empty immobile base later at his own leisure? And why didn't he have TIE fighters ready to counter the Resistance X-Wings who blew up Starkiller base just a day or so ago? Why didn't Azog use his giant worms to either crush the opposing armies or tunnel into the Lonely Mountain? And why are his heavily armoured orcs incapable of defeating a group of peasants who are armed with mediocre weapons and wearing almost no armour? These are but the choicest military mistakes and signs of incompetence in those films, and each one makes the villain look like a joke. By contrast, the Persians' mistakes make sure they don't win until the end of the film, but they do not make them look like a joke. I believe writers and filmmakers need to understand this. Your villains need to make mistakes, but they shouldn't make errors which ruin the story's tension or dispel the audience's suspension of disbelief. Your villains must be a credible threat at the end of the day. Thank you all for watching. I hope you all have an excellent day. Just a quick heads up, I'm probably going to make a critique of 300 in future because of how popular it is and because of its cultural impact, but I've got other video ideas in the pipeline so I'm unsure in what order I will be releasing things.